Kevin woke with a warm feeling as memories from the previous night came washing back over him. Jade was the most beautiful woman, but one thing he liked most about her was that she seemed completely unaware of it. He remembered the first time he met her, he was going to sit on the far side of the bus, away from everyone until the fates intervened and a strange young woman with blue luminescent makeup put her bag on the bench seat, taking up all the room. Instead, he sat beside Jade, and their conversation started as naturally as if they had already known each other for years. She had the puffy eyes of a girl awakened early in the morning. She didn't usually smile, but never looked sad, like a badass model. He remembered her rounded lips and how they felt briefly touching his, but why did she leave so suddenly? What he knew of her past didn't bother him either, since he hadn't exactly led a perfect life. Besides, in his line of work, it would be hypocritical to be judgmental and he didn't like hypocrites. Last night was like a vacation from the cold existence of his regular life. Why couldn't every day be a vacation? Well, why not? He used to get a rush from scraping a living out of doing things no one else can do. Selling homemade secure communicators to street gangs, bootleg drones to barons or surveillance to anyone who will pay for it. Until now, he didn't care about what was right or wrong and just wanted to be left alone, but he was tired of the wolf at the door and wondered what it would be like having a real job and a steady squeeze. Kevin made a bowl of shreddies and milk as he did most mornings. Bachelor chow, he thought and added a heaping tablespoon of brown sugar. Three cups of black coffee later and he decided a double-double or latte was for people who didn't really like coffee but drank it anyway. Enough daydreaming. It was time to hit the books. Kevin was studying an open course from a university in Connecticut. It wasn't related to his trade, but he had many interests, and he was between clients and had time for a detour. Ironically, he liked to study to stop from thinking about things he would rather not think about. He was taking another course on cryptocurrencies and this one was called The Rise of Crypto and the chapter he was reading was called Cryptocurrency in Canada. It was about the accidental rise of Canadian dollar-backed cryptocurrency, called loonies, to become the world's reserve currency. He considered himself more of a small picture person and was interested in the details of how things worked. When he was a kid, he would spend hours on Wikipedia reading articles on everything from animals, munitions, or electronics. He would become fascinated with something and read everything he could find and imagine how he could solve some scientific problem or make discoveries that would make him famous. When he was five, he drew a picture of a robotic human leg which would turn him into the fastest man in the world. All he came up with was a design for a hinged rod with an electric motor that somehow made the leg bend back and forth. He realized inventing was going to be harder than he thought, but he didn't give up. When he was 11, he was obsessed with new crowdfunded, low-budget hacker rockets. He dreamed of building rockets and launching them into space. He played behind his house on the dusty prairie and picked up a stick and threw it into the sky like a rocket, imagining the heat of the engines blasting against his face as it accelerated and disappeared into a dot in the azure Saskatchewan sky. His heart raced, and he leapt into the air with boyish glee, grinning from ear to ear. He spread his arms and imagined looking down at the curvature of Earth and down on his home somewhere in North America, which filled the horizon from coast to coast. Dressed in a spacesuit from the Apollo missions, he quipped data with glib confidence to his imaginary mission control. When Kevin was 12, he had a go at rocket building himself. While cooking chemicals for the solid fuel rocket engine in a tin can on the stove, they ignited and he dropped it and spilled molten cherry red pools of erupting, hissing rocket fuel on the kitchen floor and white smoke and the stench of burning vinyl filled the kitchen. He panicked and spooned up the molten drops and put them back in the can and tried to suffocate the fire by holding his hand over top. The compression built up like in a barrel of a cannon and pushed burning gases onto his hand. The pain was intense, but he still did his best to scrape out the burn marks on the old linoleum flooring. His parents came home, and the smell startled them, and they found the burn marks on the kitchen floor. Kevin! Get your ass over here! Damn it! You could have burned the house down! What the hell are you trying to prove? I should put you out on the street! His dad yelled, Kevin stood there mute with his hand closed in a cup shape. He stood wide-eyed, as his dad continued to rip him to shreds. Still screaming, he took his belt off to flog his son. 
the searing pain was not as bad as his fear of his father finding out he had not only burned the floor but also burned his hand. What are you hiding? What's in your hand? His father demanded to know, so he slowly opened his hand, revealing the large patch of oozing, blackened skin. Oh my goodness! What have you done to yourself? His mother rushed in, holding the back of his hand to examine the palm. Her face was a mixture of anger and horror. His dad calmed down, put his belt back on, but still permanently grounded him from the rocket business. His parents were clearly overreacting, and he dreamed of the day that he would be old enough to have his own house in the country, complete with a bunker for launching rockets. By 2045, the Amateur Hacker Scientist Network made some progress in bringing Kevin's dream to life. Graphene and 2DPA1 plastic had become cheap and available, and they could use it to construct composite resins with 3D printers for rocket parts. The engine was the most expensive part, but ceramics technology had also improved to where they could afford to buy them. The electronics were off the shelf and cost a fraction of what NASA used to pay when they were in the business. Kevin did some of his own research into electronics and robotics and became a regular and respected contributor to online forums. No one knew who was just 13. Kevin's father began beating his younger brother like he had beaten Kevin, and one day, when Kevin was 17, he came home late one night, strung out from a meth jag, and saw his eight-year-old brother with black eye. Kevin couldn't let that happen to Jimmy. Not again. Years of resentment and rage towards his father boiled and burst out of him. He lost it on his still-sleeping father, jumping on him and punching him in the face, over and over. His dad tried to get up, but Kevin punched him back down. When his screaming mother covered his father with her own body to protect him, Kevin came to his senses and sat down to wait for the RCMP and ambulance to arrive. It was decided by the powers that be, it would be in Kevin's best interest to join the army and go to the Ukraine rather than go to jail and become a hardened criminal. When he was overseas, he found out intelligence was a gig he was good at. Online research and hacking got him information he needed from the virtual world, but often that wasn't enough and he had to go out into the real world. Being a gumshoe wasn't different from being a hacker. It's just a different interface. Social engineering, monkey in the middle, and other hacking techniques were all a normal part of his tool belt. Hacking was basically a victimless crime as long as you didn't break anything, as far as he was concerned. Sure, it was against the laws of society, but what did society ever do for him? Often, his tinkering skills helped him put together a few very useful tools that weren't available off the shelf. Since he was a kid, he liked to take things apart and put them back together. He especially liked electronics. If you take apart an old TV you can take the pile of resistors, transistors, capacitors and processors and use them to make any number of different projects. If there was a part he didn't have, he could buy them cheap from the web. To him it was almost like sorcery you take a transistor from a freshly harvested corpse, a dab of melted lead, upload a sprinkling of tweaked code, connect it all to a magic servo waiver remote thingamajig under the light of a full moon and pow, it's alive. Another day passed, and Kevin woke and glanced at the clock on his computer screen already reading 8am. The sun was straining through the accumulated grime that splashed outside his small basement window. The seal had long gone, and vapor trapped between the layers of glass had condensed, dripped, froze, and thawed like yesterday's mistakes and today's regrets. Tomorrow was another story and he hoped today would be a turning point. He inserted his non-prescription smart contacts lenses but turned them off for now, since he liked to have a full range of vision when he was doing surveillance. He flattened the one over his forearm and gave it a gentle push which triggered it into closing around his arm like a snake spiraled around a branch. A tap with two fingers booted it up and the wraparound screen activated. He tested the gyroscopic center focus by rotating his arm back and forth to make sure the middle of the screen remained facing him. While putting on his overcoat, he felt two haptic taps on his, signaling his ride was here, and then tapped the confirm icon. As ordered, his ride was a mid-sized, two-seated, Korean-made, driverless electric car affectionately known as a beaver, and with its rounded top and trunk in front, it looked like one, minus the tail. He climbed in, shut the door, and commanded his one to take him to the bank of Beijing. Wrapped in his beaver, 
Kevin would fit in like any Johnny lunch bucket lucky enough to still have a job to go to. His new client had provided him the location of the target, but they needed to know where the target lived and other places he frequents. As usual, he knew little about his client but they paid full price without complaining and implied more work could be coming. In their conversation, they had a terse, don't screw up tone that came in loud and clear, and with times being what they are, he needed the work. Kevin arrived near the Bank of Beijing building and waited in the car for the target to arrive. He was told the target parks in a private underground parkade, so Kevin waited outside within sight of the entrance for him to arrive. In newer buildings, such as the Bank of Beijing, the South, East and West sides had floor-to-ceiling black glass to hide the microscopic mesh that was embedded in the photovoltaic collectors. It appeared to be a giant rectangular black crystal, thrust from the depths. The roof held an angular glass pyramid where an unseen billionaire had his penthouse office, or perhaps, one of his homes. Kevin decided the discreet way to follow the target would be to attach a tracking device to his car and let the device do all the work. He thought about pretending to lean over to tie his shoelace and then attach a magnetic tracker under the car, but a fancy man like that would probably have proximity sensors to detect when anyone got close enough to spit. His client wanted this done on the down low, so the target doesn't know he is under surveillance. Beside Kevin, a homeless man pushed a shopping cart full of salvage down the sidewalk, furtively glancing at the security camera. The wheels squeaked and rattled a tattletale call, and the man pushed fast, to get away before they chased him away. The man passed, and Kevin got out of the car and walked past the ramp, casually dropping a tiny object. He continued walking a full circle around the block until he got back to his car. To a casual observer, there was nothing unusual about Kevin's presence here. Although this was the financial district, Kevin looked like he might be one of the many working-class people that provided support for the executives in their crystal towers. His pants were synthetic, made to look like old-fashioned denim, complete with fading in the usual places. Casual but not ghetto, or he might appear to be a member of the criminal and unemployed lower classes. Actually, there was just a thin line of separation between them and him. It was early spring, and the polar vortex was replaced by a heat dome that burned the winter snow, leaving a layer of sand and gravel like a receding glacier. He left his jacket in the car since it had warmed up enough to look normal without one. Playing the role, he adopted a softer appearance, and his gait became leisurely and he looked like an office worker in no hurry to return to his dollar-a-day cubicle. He got back in his beaver and tinted the windows, so it was less obvious there was someone waiting and watching. The dashboard held two small receivers, far apart to provide the greatest triangulation, and then checked the connections to his one. Soon, he spotted the target, a black, 2053 BMW limousine with driver. He tapped his one and visually immersed himself with the binocular cameras on the micro drone. The limousine signaled left, stopped, and waited for the oncoming traffic before making the turn. He pulled back on his joystick and lifted drone the size of a bee and hovered it behind the lamppost. He flipped it upside down so the quad propellers were now underneath and rotated it to face the car. The limousine turned and crossed the sidewalk and when the lamp post was no longer exposed to the driver's or passenger's field of vision, the drone darted towards the back of the car and dove underneath. He pulled it sharply up, colliding with the undercarriage of the car, trying to attach the magnet. Kevin instantly released control, and he saw the drone hit the ground. Shit. The car passed the RFID detector and slowed, waiting for the overhead door to open. Soon it would be too late and the car shut behind the door and he wouldn't get another chance until it left. Now the drone was resting on its propellers, making a takeoff difficult. If I try to start it, the propellers will hit the ground hard and might bounce it high enough to take off, unless they break. The 2DPA1 two-dimensional plastic chassis was light and strong, so this might be possible, although he had never tried it before. He quickly set it to auto-stabilize and hit the throttle. He clenched his teeth and struggled to regain control of the drone. The video jerked erratically before stabilizing, he was back in the air. The drone barely caught up to the limo, and he gained elevation to contact the bottom of the car. He cut the throttle and this time he saw the drone was now attached. Yes. He figured, even with his misstep, 
the chances of being detected were almost zero, since if someone saw the little drone, they would think it was an insect. The drone's signal faded into static as the car descended deeper into the parkade and Kevin tapped his wand to send the map to the periphery of his vision and shut off the drone's cameras to save batteries. The tracking device used low-frequency radio and the ISM band since cellular wireless signals could be easily tracked. Because of its small size, it did not have a powerful signal, and he programmed it to send out a millisecond-long ping every five seconds. This way, the tiny battery could last several days. The range was only two kilometers with a clear line of sight, and less if there were buildings in the way. The signal couldn't penetrate the deep concrete and earth that lay between Kevin and the car, but this didn't matter, since there was only one way out, and he was going to stay there until it leaves. He kept his eyes on the entrance and used the text-to-speech function to listen to a blog while he waited. He reached into his backpack and removed a bag of potato chips and an insulated coffee cup and got settled in for a long wait. Later, he listened to music from his playlist that ranged from contemporary to 90s grunge. A lawyer acting on behalf of an anonymous client hired Kevin and judging by the quality of the lawyer's spacious downtown office, the client must be very rich and therefore crooked. What about the person he was following? Probably the same. One douchebag spying on another douchebag. Maybe after they locate this guy, they will send in a black bag specialist to put a bug on his computer and in his office. To avoid attracting attention, he moved his car now and then and drove short distances so the building's security guards wouldn't become suspicious, but he kept close enough that he could detect the pings when the subject left the parkade. He stretched his long legs as best he could inside the car, grimacing from the discomfort. Hacking was a lot faster paced than surveillance but didn't have the physical danger. It was more like his time overseas, with long periods of boredom interspersed with short periods of terror. His mind wandered to Jade. Did they have a future together? He thought of many scenarios on how it could work out, and then he thought of even more of how it could go wrong. There always seemed to be a point in his relationships where he and the woman discover that they weren't compatible. He wanted a woman who understood him, and they could live a normal life. Living on the edge creates complications which scare off members of the fairer sex when the shit hits the fan. Somehow, Jade didn't seem like the skittish type. She was different. Too much time to think. Kevin tried to focus on the job at hand. I keep going over the same shit, over and over. I need something to focus on. He loaded a different article about network security and played it on the car speakers. He heard a ping and tapped his one to bring up a transparent map in his left field of vision in his contact lenses. A black circle appeared on the map near the exit from the parkade. Follow streaming coordinates from interface black dot, he commanded. Directions acknowledged. Replied a female voice, and the beaver merged with traffic. Follow 250 meters behind streaming coordinates. Directions acknowledged. The automated voice from the dash replied, as the beaver adjusted its speed and position in the traffic flow. A few blocks from the bank of Beijing, the character of the city changed from the upmarket downtown, to where many commercial buildings appeared to have been closed for years, seven years. That was the first year of the sovereign debt crisis. Like many riches to rag stories, the decline started slowly, then suddenly. The worldwide economy was sluggish, and China's corporate and municipal debt kept rising, to keep their economy growing, then one municipality after another went bankrupt and China announced it would no longer make interest payments to foreigners on its debt. All hell broke loose in the financial markets and most commerce ground to a halt. Trade with China stopped and factories around the world shut down from lack of parts. Banks stopped loaning money to each other and then stopped loaning to anyone. No one could get a mortgage or a car loan. The government sprayed money into the economy like it was water from a fire hose, but it had little effect since no amount of money could make a factory produce when it doesn't have the parts. After leaving the army, Kevin struggled to keep his head above water and kept himself fed with hacking and surveillance gigs. His reputation grew and his gigs became better, but he wished for something more permanent, safer, and less sleazy. He passed an old movie theater that had been converted into a live theater, then briefly a haunted house, and now vacant. Sections of the masonry facade had fallen off, revealing rusting steel supports and wooden frame. 
most of the top row of letters remained on the marquee, spelling Deadmont N with the D hanging sideways and the O missing. Someone broke the glass door, and a homeless person shuffled out, his face pale and eyes sickened from opioid addiction. Another fentanyl zombie, Kevin thought to himself. Who knows, that could have been me a few years ago. He didn't come to this side of the river very often, so had a closer look at the buildings. Some were occupied with residential tenants, although some clearly were not. He looked through broken glass and saw light shining from gaping holes in a burned-out ceiling. A building even had a corner missing, as if someone bombed it. It reminded him of a village outside of Odessa, Ukraine that had been heavily damaged after a battle. It triggered a memory? It wasn't so much a memory as it was a sensation. It was what he felt when he was in the Ukraine, taking shelter from the drones in bombed-out ruins. He could hear the screams and smell the blood and he felt trapped, like a cow led to the killing floor. He shook it off and looked for the target's car. He was distracted and lost it. Did it turn or is it in traffic ahead? The signal was gone. Did the drone get knocked off from the rough roads? He took manual control of the beaver and passed other cars to work through the traffic. His receiver pinged again. The target was straight ahead. He couldn't see it when he was directly behind since there were four other cars between, but they couldn't see him either. That's the way he liked it. The private road on the other side had smoother asphalt and traffic sped up. His car followed the black dot south on 109th Street and he commanded the car to follow closer to avoid slipping behind. Since the target had a driver, it could navigate the road hazards with more facility than those who use driverless mode. Executives rarely hired a driver to just save time, but the primary duty was to be a bodyguard and he would be on the lookout for kidnappers, assassins, as well as nosy private detectives. They passed through Old Strathcona, close to Kevin's apartment, on the way to Calgary Trail. The road was straighter and cars easier to spot, so he ordered the car to back off. Follow 300 meters behind streaming coordinates. Directions acknowledged. His stomach growled uncomfortably from the black coffee and junk food he had been consuming while waiting. How long before the target reaches his destination? Ten minutes? An hour? The black dot stepped off Calgary Trail to the left. He looked up and saw the target was in a cluster of retail stores. He looked at a map and picked the name of a random place 100 meters before, and ordered the car to stop there. Intermediate destination, save on foods. Kevin kept his eye on the target, and saw the driver get out and enter a liquor store beside the road. He tinted his windows and removed a digital telescope from his pocket and pointed it at the entrance. A few minutes later, the driver exited with a brown bag containing a bottle, before walking, not back to his own car, but another parked car. Kevin saw a small bag handed to him out of an opening in a tinted window. Okay. He likes to mix his poisons, Kevin whispered to himself. The driver got back in the car and continued south. They passed the white mud, over the Hende, and through newer residential neighborhoods until they were at the outskirts of the city. The Nisku Industrial Park used to be the center for the heavy oil industry in Alberta. Since the tar sands were downsized by lower demand for oil, few of the remaining buildings were used by the petrochemical industry and many were abandoned or used for renewable energy sources such as solar, wind, geothermal or, most of all, hydrogen. One was repurposed for laser tag and another for indoor go-kart racing. Further south, companies in the industrial park were related to agriculture, which was profitable when the rains came at the right time of year. Past Nisku, and they entered the open highway, making it easier for Kevin to keep track of the target and easier for the target to spot him. A grey-brown haze drifted in like a ghost of a cloud and he could smell a faint odor of burning wood from a distant forest fire somewhere up north. He saw the closest of the windmills, stretching from horizon to horizon. They were showing their age and had lines of rust dripping down the white paint. He remembered when he was 14, the democratic socialist government started the Green Deal and largely replaced natural gas with green hydrogen. It was one of many passing initiatives to stimulate the stagnant economy, and windmills sprouted across the prairie landscape like crocuses in the melting snow. For every 1,000 windmills he saw a boxy converter station, which used electrolysis to generate hydrogen and feed it into the pipelines. 
electrolysis became very cost-effective since scientists discovered cheap catalysts to replace ones made with precious metals. He noticed a dirt road leading to a Christmas tree of bulbous pipes and a rusty ship's wheel of valves, indicating the site used to be a gas well. Wind farms away from the city were clustered near old gas wells to utilize the abandoned pipeline network and natural underground storage, where generating stations pumped hydrogen into the porous depleted natural gas formation. During the chill of winter, they piped it to hungry furnaces in the city. Every farmhouse he saw had a little shed where they generated their own electricity with hydrogen-powered fuel cells or sometimes old internal combustion generators. The buildings also had solar shingles on the roof of every barn, workshop, and home. Follow one kilometer behind streaming coordinates. He said, knowing that on these open roads, any tail would be easier to spot. The greenhouse gas sun beat down hard on his car in an approaching bank of smoke, which painted the target car into a gray silhouette, before melting it into the highway. He turned up the air conditioning and remembered the other part of the green deal, to run the oil sands on nuclear power. He remembered when he was in the army, before they shipped him overseas, he was stationed up in Cold Lake to guard the heavy oil extraction facilities. Nuclear reactors small enough to fit on a semi-trailer connected to boilers which fed steam into galleries of parallel insulated silver pipes. He patrolled the length on foot, following the snaking pipelines across the cut lines before they turned underground to heat and liquefy the heavy tar 500 meters down. Before, the oil sands burned massive amounts of natural gas and created 30% of all Canada's greenhouse gas emissions. There was not too much demand for petroleum anymore but oil companies still heated the refineries with hydrogen. Too little, too late, thought Kevin. Besides, the green infrastructure was aging and there was talk of turning back to fossil fuels. It didn't make sense economically, but the idea was if we turned back to the technology of the past, we could reclaim the prosperity of the past. This attitude was disquieting to Kevin, and he wondered if this was how it felt to be in the last days of the Roman Empire, when the barbarians were at the gate and the aqueduct stopped bringing water. The smoke blocked his visual contact, so he put his faith in the pings and had to keep his eyes peeled on side roads in case it turned. The next ping showed the target turned west at Leduc on the straight, flat Highway 39. Further west, the target drew him closer to the hazy orange fireball of the afternoon sun. He squinted, lowered the visor, and tinted the windows to make visual contact in the smoky glare. The sun glinted on the skeletons of dead trees that looked like fingers reaching toward the sky for rain that never came. The grass was turning green after the melting of the winter snows, but it was still early spring. The land was undulating like the low swells in the deep ocean from a storm beyond the horizon. He passed a small group of boys in front of a sprawling farm complex. Their skin was tanned or naturally brown and all had highlights from the sun etched in their hair. One older boy stepped forward like a pitcher and threw the rock at the transformer so hard, Kevin heard the metallic thud as he drove by. The boy was about 13 and had blonde hair past the bottoms of his ears. His jeans were so ripped at the knees, they threatened to turn into cutoffs at any moment. They were the children of the hired hands, the mechanics and technicians who kept the automated tractors, diggers, combines, hay mowers and feeding equipment running. The children were trying to knock off the transformer, not only because they like breaking things, but some children like to collect parts of the power grid. Their favorites were porcelain insulators, but throwing rocks usually broke them. Possession of an unbroken insulator was like a badge of honor, since it meant you somehow shimmied up the pole to pull it off. Kevin saw an automatic digger crawling across a hill, pushing dirt to the lower side. The hill was too steep to retain moisture and topsoil, so farmers used diggers to scrape away at it and create flat two-meter terrace rings all the way to the top. The black dot disappeared briefly as the target passed over the rise. In the distance, he spotted a grove of living trees to the right of the highway. Someone had been watering them. Kevin shifted his head left and right trying to see the target. Blink, blink, the dot reappeared and inched forward evenly on the map and Kevin relaxed. He thought he saw something turn into the grove and the next blink of the black dot quickly confirmed it. Continue west on Highway 39. Directions acknowledged. Without slowing, he passed the road where the target car disappeared. 
a heavy polymer gate hinged on grand brick pillars stood at the entrance. The quarter section was fenced with three-meter-high concrete, cast and dyed to look like wood planks. Create address, name target, assign target current coordinates. Assignment complete. He continued down the highway until he was out of sight and took a side road and parked. The black dot continued 200 meters north before stopping and he deactivated the pinging to create radio silence at the target's destination. Kevin got out of the car and relieved himself in the bushes. He took a deep breath of the smoke and noticed it at undertones of burning plastic and he wondered if houses had burned as well. The fumes made his eyes feel dry and irritated, as if he was sleepy. Although the sunset was more than an hour away, the sun had already turned a pinkish color yet cast his shadow with an orange background. I'm burning daylight, he thought to himself, since he needed light for the best quality video. He returned to the car and brought up a satellite image of the target's location on his lenses. The aerial photo revealed a huge three-story house with a rooftop patio and hot tub, built into the side of a hill. Depending on how much was underground, he guessed it had to be about 700 square meters. He tapped his wand to select the center of the house on the map then held his finger down and looked away, using the focal point on this contact lenses to drag the selection and form a circle with a radius of 200 meters. Then he tapped the rendezvous location to complete the circuit. The computer program traced a line originating from his car, three kilometers to the house, around the circle surrounding the house, and back. He opened a composite clamshell case. When he built it, he cushioned it with sculpted styrofoam lined with black velvet and, in the center, nestled a small quad drone, the size of a ping-pong ball. He plugged it into his one and uploaded the instructions. Stepping out of the car, he held the drone in his hand and tapped his one. The drone instantly came to life and whirred 200 meters straight up before beginning its pre-programmed journey. The drone operated in complete radio silence. It received GPS signals but transmitted nothing. Kevin bootlegged it from scratch with over-the-counter parts he ordered from Korea. He wanted a drone that didn't connect to the internet and didn't contain the mandatory Snoop chip required by law. If you wanted one, you had to make one yourself or hire an expensive mechanic, like Kevin, to build one for you. Each was a work of art, like a Fabergé egg. To avoid attracting attention, he drove a few kilometers away and parked in a small hamlet. He watched the map with the estimated progress on his lenses and saw it should have reached the perimeter surrounding the house and should begin its slow circular holding pattern, taking video with its high-definition camera pointed toward the center. It was too far from the house for the target to see or hear it, but close enough to get excellent video. An hour later, he drove to the rendezvous location and heard the quiet hum as the drone descended, 200 meters from where it had started. He held out his hand and the onboard artificial intelligence detected it and landed with the precision and agility of a trained falcon. Kevin smiled like it was his beloved bird returning from a successful hunt. He plugged in the cable and downloaded the video to his one before placing it with care back in its case. He left when he packed it away to avoid the risk of being spotted. A big shot like the target would probably have drones of his own and security personnel keeping track of the area surrounding the perimeter. They probably wouldn't check this far from his property, but he couldn't be sure. Destination, Stony Plain Destination accepted Rule number one. Never return by the same route. The car continued north on the bumpy ruts that had once been smooth and graveled. He quickly fast-forwarded to the midpoint of the video to make sure it recorded. A beautiful young blonde woman was climbing out of a pool, naked. He zoomed in and the pink sun glistened on her augmented, exaggerated, and toned body. Rivulets ran down the goose flesh on her back, tracing every curve as she took a towel from the maid. Her wet footprints faded as she lazily strolled across the Italian tile toward the walkout basement entrance to meet the man that just arrived in the limo. He likes expensive toys, Kevin observed. Satisfied that he had good video, he shut it off and cracked open a celebratory Mickey of rum. He had found everything the lawyer wanted, and more. He looked forward to collecting his fee of 500 loonies, but he found it hard to believe all they wanted was this guy's address. Any flat foot could have done that. They're probably trying me out. The rum burned on his empty stomach, and he quickly forgot about work. There was something about driving in the country, buzzed, 
that gave him a special kind of euphoria. It reminded him of his teen years back home, driving around with his buddies on the gravel backroads of Saskatchewan with a cold 2-4. Then his thoughts turned to Jade, and he sent her a text.